think I wrote down whatever that piece of paper went was about the Super Bowl party uh, next week. Uh, I'm not sure what time it starts, but it's a Super Bowl party. <laughs> and another a major announcement, God's still in control. Thank you, Lord, for the moisture. Valentine's Banquet, February the 12th, get with Jimmy. The youth group uh, kick back off every Wednesday evening at 5.30. Sunday school, church, I'm going to start meeting Sunday school, start meeting at 9.30, elders meeting first and third Sunday. Always helps to text me a reminder, Chase. <clears throat> Women of Joy Conference is coming up in April. Going to help with the fine arts in March. Eight and nine, and then our, our prayer concern, and I have a thank you here for you. Forest reading. Please add to the announcements that I'm so grateful for the prayers, food, and love shown to myself and my family. I truly love and am grateful that God blessed us with a wonderful church family. I could use continued prayers for good breathing and for my solid. Oh, yeah, for. Salivary gland to work again. I know God would like his to work a little better too. <clears throat> Who knew how important they they are, and, and uh, they really are. So uh, please continue to pray for Priya. And the rest of our prayer list. Anyone else? week or week before Max was praying and he said, Lord, thank you for the moisture and uh, we'd like to have a little bit more and now look what happened this week. Uh, it's nice to have elders that uh, God hears them when they pray. Amen. I'd like to tell you the other time he rescued me out of some places, but better not. <coughs> yeah, the Lord is so good. lost a sister this week. Sorry, and, um, well, I'm going to say it was a blessing because she wasn't living a good life with some physical conditions. Uh, so if we keep her family in our prayers. Um, thank What's you. her name? Cindy? The 20th, we will uh, keep back off the men's group. Bible so, study, yeah. 20th. Is that a Monday on a Sunday evening? That's again, on the Sunday evening. Okay. We'll do it after the women and we'll bring some sort of babysitting and all that kind of good stuff. So. Yep. Okay. And the Bible study is going to kick back off. That's good news. Uh, next weekend, my speech team has a really big tournament in Hassel, about like three, four hours away. 
So I think it's great for our guys and, and the music because it's really going to need a lot of our state competition. So uh, if you could keep my team and just like, I'd appreciate it. I wanted to re invite everybody to tonight's study. It's not a traditional Bible study. We put, and we should, so much into study and prayer and worship. But there's so much about our walk that is life experiences. We all have developed a personal relationship with our Savior. And we have taken the value away from fellowship, especially in these last couple years. And so this is going to be a lot about sharing. Thank you, Susan. Also, uh, I forgot to thank the women for the wonderful breakfast this morning. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank all the women who helped prepare my mom's um, funeral dinner. I can't remember who they were, but Mrs. Leitner was there. I saw her. There were lots of them. The church has been busy. Uh, these beautiful flowers were left from a Donna service. And Nana just walked in here. And boy, the service will be Wednesday at 2 o'clock right here. Yeah. Thanks, Keep Dan and her family in your prayers. I just want to thank God for this wonderful blessing. We're going to let you hear this little lady. Oh, yeah. Hey, so you couldn't bring for those of you who don't know. Three months old. Hey. Nice to meet you, sir. Anything else from the body? Good to have some a joy to follow up our concerns with. Okay, you all would pray with me. Lord God, we are so grateful and thankful. We do have needs and concerns and you know them. These uh prayer list, Lord, the healing that uh, we so desire from you spiritually and physically. Thank you, Lord God, so much for the rain that we sent, the moisture and the snow and the rain that you're sending. Lord, I pray right now that our worship and our, our time, our fellowship time here to, today is uh, pleasing and uh, pleasing to you and worthy of and comfort to the state's family, the Madonna states and the Land Normally states family, Lord. Uh, these are trying times. They're not surprising to you, Lord God. Um, please help, help us understand, guide, direct us through these trying times uh, in your way, in your will. And Lord, please hear us as we pray together the prayer you taught us so important. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>
about the Lord ready to give today. Oh, that just a minute. We got work to do. As I was preparing for this, and I want to bring up the scripture that I've, I've read several times during the offering. And it comes out of Psalms 116, 12 through 14. It says, What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord. And this got me thinking, you know, I'm, I'm obviously not the best at it, but I don't mind sharing the word. And, of course, the giving. You know, like we all tithe, we all do the right thing. And I'm pretty good at forgiving most people. But as I was going through Scripture, uh, forgiveness and reconciliation are two different things. And reconciliation kept... Uh, popping back up. So, uh, of course, I looked it up in the dictionary. And reconciliation, and I'm not going to go through all the, the definition, but one thing that stuck out is reconciliation is the final step in the forgiving process. And it says it takes two people to reconcile, but only one to forgive. So, no matter what our circumstances with ourselves or with other individuals uh, or with God, again, it takes two to reconcile. And as we come here to give today, reconciliation is primary to giving. And I'm going to get another set of eyeballs out here. This is on my phone here. But it says, in Matthews 5, 2, Jesus says, Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Our broken relationships affect our generosity. If you want to be truly generous, we must first seek reconciliation in our relationship. Uh, it says, what does that mean? It means we must forgive, we must serve, and care for people as Christ's hands and feet. As followers of Christ, we're all called to be agents of reconciliation, bringing healing where, the, where there is hurt, peace where there is conflict, and righting the wrongs of this broken world. The person who writes the large check, yet is harsh with his spouse because of dealings and quarrels with his neighbor, is not a generous person. This puts, uh, Jesus puts such an emphasis on reconciliation that he advises us to hold off, giving financially until relationships are made right. So, as we give here today, let's go out also and make reconciling a form of giving. Heavenly Father, as we gather here as a group of givers that you've called, Lord, we ask that you bless these tithes and offerings to your kingdom. Lord, 
Teach us to be givers in more ways than just financially, Lord. It's, it's your work to love others, to do as you've done for us, that we're called to do in your kingdom and here on earth. I ask that you be with us in our walk, that we do just that, and glorify you in everything we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I just kind of wanted to go over to the, uh, kind of titled it, The Last Hours of Jesus' Life. Um, it starts with the Last Supper, where Jesus provided the uh, an example of, of servant leadership and also humility by taking his garment off and washing the feet of his disciples. And from there, it, it kind of went downhill. Uh, after that, he talks about uh, the denial and betrayal from those that were closest to him and uh, Peter and G uh, Judas. And then he took him to the Garden of Gethsemane where they failed him again by falling asleep while he prayed. Uh, shortly after that was the uh, Judas's kiss and his, his arrest to follow. And the verse that stuck out that I was reading was Mark 14:50. It says, Then everyone deserted him and fled. The man who was going to save the world, everyone deserted and fled him. Then there was the false testimonies about Jesus. And the crowd in which he had recently taught and they praised him were now yelling, Crucify him. He was then beaten, spit on, mocked, crucified, and died. And we are just like his disciples every day. Our sinful nature is just like Judas and Peter. And the only person that saves us from this is Jesus Christ. Romans 5.8 says this, But God shows his love for us because we were, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, as you died on the cross for our sins, Lord, be with us this week, guide us and direct us so others may see you through our actions. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
I came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains. But he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about two thousand, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they begged, began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him. But said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you, and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in, in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to hear it and to hear it spoken and preached this morning. God, thank you that we are able to be here and to just to be taught. God, be with Phil as he stands this morning to present your word. God, open our hearts and our ears that we may hear and receive. In Jesus' name. Thank you, John and Kelly. Again, I've titled the message, The Disciple That Stayed Home. Let me give you the background. Jesus traveled across the Sea of Galilee to a new region called the region of the Gerasenes. And as the boat arrived on the shore, a man came running toward Jesus. Matthew says there were two men. Uh, and the man was demon-possessed. Uh, Luke tells us that he was naked, wearing no clothes. He was screaming at the top of his voice, What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth, Son of the Most High God? Jesus exorcised the demons out of the person. The person had lived for many years in the graveyard. He lived among the tombs. Uh, I believe it was Luke said he hung out in the solitary places. People avoided the area because he was known to be violent. Uh, he cut himself with rocks and stones. He had tried to be uh, restrained. They put chains on him and he would break himself loose. He was a mess. He was a despicable person in every sense that you can imagine. And as Jesus arrived on the coast, this man and his companions came running up to Jesus, screaming at the top of his voice, 
It was really the demons that were talking and not the man. Jesus asked him, what is your name? And the guy says, my name or our name is Legion, because there was more than one demon. There were multiple demons. Jesus cast the demons out, and the fellow had his right mind and started sitting at the feet of Jesus. I left that one small item of the story chase. When the demons were recognized that they, they were going to be exercised, they said to Jesus, they said, we don't want to go into the abyss, uh, into hell, into Hades. There's a big, a big uh, feedlot of swine, pigs, that were close. One of the gospel writers says it was about 2,000 pigs. The demon said, if you're going to cast us out, could you cast us into the pigs? Parenthetically, what was Jews' attitude toward pigs? Unclean. Could Jews eat pigs? What do you think these Jews were doing raising pigs in the first place? What? Cover, making a living off of something that was illegal, spiritually speaking. Uh, but anyway, just think about that. So anyway, Jesus cast the demons into the pigs, and the pigs ran down the hill and ran over a cliff and were drowned in the sea. And the demons of this person sitting in his right mind at the feet of Jesus. The swine heard keepers ran off into town and told the town people, the owners of the pigs, what had happened to their livelihood. And they came out and uh, observed the situation. They saw the man in his right mind sitting at the feet of Jesus. But they were more concerned about what they had lost, their pigs. And so they asked Jesus to leave. One of the sad verses of Scripture, the receding Jesus, when Jesus is asked to leave. I hope none of you have ever done that. And while Jesus was getting into the boat, the person out of whom the demons had been cast comes running up to Jesus and said, Jesus, take me with you. I want to be your disciple. And the scripture says, Jesus forbade him. Jesus said, no, I don't want you to come with me. I want you to go back home, and I want you to tell the people there the good things that God has done for you. The region of the Gerizines here, uh, it was called the Decapolis, comes from the word Deca. Anybody know what Deca means? Ten. And polis, anybody know what? And an app polis? The word city. And so it was a region of ten cities. Jesus could not stay. Jesus was asked to leave. And yet Jesus wanted the light of God to still shine in this dark area. And he had one chance that this man out of whom the demons had been cast. Go back home to your region of ten cities and you tell everybody the good things that have happened to you. The story I want to tell you about this morning, I want you to look at this from the perspective of the person who had the demons cast out. We're not looking at Jesus or the disciples. Look at this man. And the first thing I want you to notice is that he had a history. He had a history. Oh, did he have a history. Um, you know, Jesus told him to go back home and tell the good things that God has done for you. And so I want you to imagine that you were living in the region of the Decapolis in one of those homes of the ten cities, and you heard a knock on the door, and you opened the door, and this Previously, demon-possessed man was standing at your door, 
And he asked if he can come in and drink a cup of tea with you, or maybe a cup of coffee. And so you invite him in, and he starts talking to you. And he says, I would like to tell you my story. History is a story. Well, I want you to think of the word history, H-I-S-T-O-R-Y. And I want you to put another S in it and to put a space on it. And what do you have? His story. Imagine that he has come to your house and he is telling you his story. He says, I want to tell you, I was one of the most messed up people that you could ever meet in your life. I was demon possessed. Not only one, I had many demons in me, and they had taken over my life. I couldn't think straight. I wasn't really even me, he said. I couldn't live in the city. I was living out in the graveyards, and I was staying all night in the tombs. I was screaming night and day. People were afraid to even walk by where I was because I would attack them. I was a mess. That was his story. Now remember Jesus had told him to go back home and tell them the good things that God has done for you. When you want to tell somebody about God, the first thing that you need to tell them is your story. Everybody has a story. Everybody has a story. And in the right circumstance and in the right situation, especially if you've met Jesus, people are willing to share their story. I'll tell you a little bit about what happened. Uh, Max didn't know this, but I was sitting with Max uh, during our meet and greet this morning. He had texted me this, this last week that he had loaded up three semi-trailer trucks full of calves and full of, in the middle of a snowstorm. And my mind started thinking, uh, I know Max at a church, but three semi-trailer trucks full of steers or cows that he's, he's selling, there's some things going on in Max's life that I don't know. And if I want to know Max, I would like to know a little bit more about his story. You with me? And so I started asking him some questions. I said, uh, how many cattle do you have? I'm not going to tell you the number. That's his business. But he, you know, you can ask him if you're interested. But, but we're talking about that. And, and he talked about that. That some of the cattle are his, and some of them, I guess, were James and, and Velma's, and maybe from the rest of them, and they, and they took care of them together. I think it was MZ and JZ or something like that. Uh, there you go. You, you heard that. Uh, he was telling me about this. And I said, well, how many horses do you have? And he was kind of embarrassed to tell me about that. But he, but he told me. For me to know Max, I need to know his story. For you to know me, you need to know my story. And because of time, it's hard for us to know everybody's story. But in a church like Dover Christian Church, where many of you have lived here you were born here, you've lived here, you're going to die here, and you have been with the same people your whole life. Most of you know each other's stories, or at least some of them. I want to encourage you to consider how could you take your story and baptize it. By that I mean to put God in it so you could tell your story to somebody else in such a way that you could tell them the good things that God has done for you. Does that make sense to you? Everybody has a story, and everybody's story 
is different. But your story is valuable, and it's important, and it's a part of what God wants you to do. To go into the area where you live and tell people the good things that God has done for you. Oh, by the way, another story. Mac's wife is named Bama. 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 I took my cowboy hat over to her store the other day, and I asked her if she could fix it. You know what she told me? She told me, no, throw it away. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was, it was really bad. But did you know, how many of you knew that she, she runs a Western store? Yeah, that's a part of her story. She is a light for Jesus that is on the west side of even Oklahoma, America, where she hangs out. And I believe and I pray and I hope that the light of Jesus shines from that place. Her story. Her story. Everybody's story is different. It's important. This guy's story, none of you have a story like his story. But oh, he did have a story. You know, I've noticed that some people kind of ooze into the kingdom of God. You know, kind of like water bubbling up out of a spring. It just kind of happens. That's the way I, that's my story. I was born into a Christian home where my mother was married to my wife. My mother was married to my father. <laughs> Neither one had been divorced or remarried. Had three brothers. And we met around the kitchen table every morning for breakfast and had Bible reading and prayer. I guess I started going to church on a pillow and almost never Miss Church. That's my story. And God reached down into that home and that family and called me. Today I'm preaching to you. That's my story. That doesn't make my story better than yours. It doesn't make it worse than yours. It's just who I am. God can use you who you are, no matter what your story. But you need to give your story to Him. It is His story. And it is your story. And when you can tell your story, it becomes history. You see that? Well, the important thing is, everybody has a story. Some people ooze into the kingdom of God, and other people come into the kingdom of God like an earthquake. Just boom. That's the way it was for this man. You know, he looked up, and here came Jesus. And the demon started screaming, and there was this spiritual encounter, and, and I don't know what all happened, but the demons left, the pigs were drowned, and he was saved, and it all happened in... 15 or 20 minutes, I guess. That was his story. And you have a story. I don't know your story. But God has a way of reaching each one of you where you are and bringing you to him. And you have a history. You have a story. This person had a story. The second thing he had is he had an encounter. His story led up to the point to where he met the Lord Jesus Christ. For him, it was out on the coast with the demons screaming, and here comes Jesus. Your story needs to include how you met Jesus. Hello, let me say that again. Your story needs to include Jesus, how you met Jesus. And I don't care, I do care, but 
it is immaterial what the details of that are. It just needs to be a part of your story. Mine, there was no earthquake. There was no flash of lightning. I was just born into a Christian home, and God brought me from almost from my mother's womb. That doesn't make my story the best or the worst. It's just mine. And you have a story. It needs to include Jesus. You haven't told the whole story until you tell how you met Jesus. Somebody say amen. Let me say that again. You haven't told the whole story until you tell how you met Jesus. There came a day when my dad was preaching at Christ Church at County Line, and I felt the moving of God's Spirit in me, and I walked down the aisle, put my hand in God, in my Father's hand, and put my heart in my Heavenly Father's hand, and made a good confession. I said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I accept Him as my personal Savior and as the Lord of my life. At the church, we went one mile north of town to Death Umphrey's Fish Pond. They call it a tank in that part of Oklahoma. Uh, the tank. And I was baptized in water in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've been a Christian ever since. Doesn't mean I've been perfect ever since. But just God doesn't save you and then throw you away and then pick you up and save you and then throw you away and then pick you up and save you. You know, your salvation is not like a basketball when you're saved and lost and saved and lost and you go dribbling through life, saved and lost. And when you're saved, you're saved. He saves. He keeps. He satisfies. my story. I had an encounter with Jesus. It wasn't an earthquake, no lightning. I just felt the move in my heart that I needed to surrender to Jesus, and I did. And I don't know whether I accepted him or whether he accepted me. <laughs> doesn't matter, but it just kind of all works together. Kind of reminds me of the old country and western song that was on the radio when I was a child. That I was looking back to see if she was looking back to see if I was looking back to see if she was looking back at me. I don't understand how God does His part and I do my part, but somehow it all works together and we become God's property. We become Christians. We're saved. The person had a history, and then he had an encounter, an encounter with Jesus. You know, some of you are embarrassed to tell your story because you think you don't know enough. It's not how much you know, it's who you know. It's who you know. This guy didn't meet a Bible college degree or a theology. He met a person, Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, what is your name? The guy told him. I want to talk to this man about names. How many of you know that I am terrible with names? <laughs> you know, when God was passing out the ability to remember people's names, I think I was fishing. I, I just missed it all. And... and uh, for those of you that I still don't know your names, I apologize and I'm sorry. Please be gracious and, and forgive me. I am just really bad at it. But I do know that names are important. Names are so important. And there's no, it's not an accident that Jesus asked this person, what is your name? Because you really, you don't know a, name, a person when you're calling them to whom it may concern. One of the steps of knowing somebody is knowing their name. Do you remember in the Garden of Eden, God came down in the coolness of the evening? Do you remember it, Jimmy? He says, Adam, called him by name. 
called him by name. You remember Moses went over to the burning bush and God says, Moses! Called him by name. Little boy Samuel was asleep and God says, Samuel, Samuel! Called him by name. Mary, the virgin, the spouse to Joseph, and suddenly an angel spoke to Mary. Called her by name. Saul of Tarsus was on the run to Damascus to persecute Christians, and suddenly a bright light shined around and said, Saul, Saul, called him by name. An encounter with Jesus, when Jesus calls you by name, and when God says, I want you, I want you to be mine. Would you give yourself to me? I'm a Christian. This person, he had an encounter. He had a history. He had an encounter. And then uh, Jesus said, I don't want you to go with me. You know, God doesn't call everybody to be a preacher. Somebody say amen. I remember one time I heard a story about a farmer who was out plowing corn. And uh, it came noontime, so he tied his horses up in the shade, and he went over and laid down in the shade of the tree and got his water and his sandwich and, and ate a little light lunch. So then after he ate, he was leaning back and kind of looking up in the sky, and the clouds came by. And he saw a GPC. He said, God has called me to preach. Go preach Christ. So he started preaching and nothing happened. Nobody was saved. Nobody was following Jesus. Uh, it was just a dead ministry. Nothing was happening. And he was telling somebody that. He says, I know God called me and said, GPC, go preach Christ. His friend said, well, did you ever consider maybe it meant go plow corn? God doesn't call everybody to be a missionary. God doesn't call everybody to be an apostle or a preacher. Some of you, maybe most of you, maybe all of you, God wants you to go back home and tell the good thing that God has done for you. Tell your story. Tell about your encounter and then tell the good thing that God has done for you. Now, I don't want you to just overlook that. Tell the good thing that God has done for you. He did not say invite them to church. How many of you have ever invited somebody to church? That's a nice thing, but that is not what God told this fellow to do, what Jesus told him to do. Tell the good thing that God has done for you. I can imagine this. He's in your living room. You drew him a cup of tea. And he says, I'd like to tell you my story. I want to tell you that I was a mess. I was one of the worst people that you've ever met. I was demon-possessed. I was violent. I was going through life screaming. People were afraid of me. And then one day I looked up and I saw Jesus coming. And Jesus asked me my name. And I told him. And Jesus cast the demons out of my life. And now I can think again. I am me. I am worth something. Because Jesus changed. Tell the good thing that God has done for you. So I challenge you to do this. Sometime in the quietness of your life, maybe you're just going to write this down and then you're going to throw, it, throw this piece of paper away. But write down on a paper what God has done for you. The reason you write it down is because it gets that out of the memory bank and it 
makes it real, it makes it concrete, it makes it rational. What has God done for you? Where would you be today if you had never met Jesus? This guy we're talking about this morning, he would still be living out in the tomb, demon possessed, naked, screaming at everybody that came by. That's what he would have been if he had not met Jesus. Have you ever prepared yourself to be able to tell somebody else your story? How you met Jesus and what a difference Jesus has made for you. I've asked Jimmy and Beth to come up and sing a song for us this morning. I want you to listen to the words of the chorus of this song. It says, God, show me where you brought me from. And what am I to do? Could you listen to it? Apparently, the words are really important. They are. It's a really uh, thought-provoking song. <laughs>
Show me where you brought me from and where I'm at again. Where would you be today if you had never met Jesus? Where would you be today if you had never met Jesus? Memory is the garden soil out of which gratitude grows. Never forget what Jesus has done for you. And then be willing to share it. This person had a story. He had an encounter. And he had a testimony. And you have all three of those things. And that's what Jesus wants you to do. Go back home and tell the good things that God has done for you. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would speak to us. May we not be passive and silent, but may we be prepared to share what you have done for us and the difference you've made to our life. Father, if there's anyone here that's never personally accepted Jesus, I pray that they would rush to the altar this morning and say, I want to be a Christian. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, let's stand and sing together.